are. It works. Good evening, everyone. We are going to get our panel started, so we'll be talking over here. If you want to grab another beer or get some food, come on over. There's a few more seats, otherwise you can kind of circle around. Welcome to the closing event of the second annual Smithsonian Food History Weekend. It's been an amazing three days here at the museum. Thank you to all of you who have joined us for them and to those of you who are just coming in tonight. I'm Susan Evans McClure. I'm the director of Smithsonian Food History Programming here at the National Museum of American History. And tonight, we will be talking about everyone's favorite subject, beer. There you go. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> but tonight, we'll be talking about beer and American history. Because as you all know, brewing has been part of American history since the founding of the nation. There you go. We have a history and beer fans. <laughs> so the program tonight actually kicks off a series that's part of our new American Brewing History Initiative. So over the next three years, the museum will be undertaking a major initiative to collect, document, and preserve the history of brewing, breweries, and the beer industry, all with the goal to explore how beer and beer history connect to larger themes in American history, and how beer helps us understand what it means to be American. So thank you to the Brewers Association, the not-for-profit trade association dedicated to small and independent American brewers, for their lead support of the American Brewing History Initiative. Thank you also to all of our generous supporters who made the entire Smithsonian Food History Weekend possible, while, where we explored our theme this year of politics on your plate. We want to thank our lead sponsor, the U.S. Farmers and Ranchers Alliance, for their generous support, along with John Deere, the Brewers Association, Wegmans, Cabot, and Melissa's Produce Company. Yeah, thank you. I hope you are all enjoying some beer here tonight, provided by the breweries and a distillery who came to, um, came to us with full kegs ready to serve. So a big thank you to Blue Jacket, Heavy Seas, Williamsburg Ale Works for donating their time and beer, and to New Columbia Distillers for donating and serving their Green Hat Gin. We know that's not beer, but it's delicious <laughs> and topical. So. Um, and please tell us how you are enjoying this entire weekend and tonight using the hashtag Smithsonian Food. With the hashtag cheer. That's an enthusiasm we appreciate. So tonight, we will be exploring four eras of American history that were pivotal to beer in America and to which beer was pivotal. So each of our speakers on the panel here will have five minutes to share a tale from their respective era. And then we're going to come back together and we'll take questions from all of you. So before we get started, I'm going to introduce, in the colonial corner, Frank Clark. He <laughs> He is the head of Historic Foodways in Colonial Williamsburg, and he does historic research on beer and brewers. I'm going to introduce everyone, I think, <laughs> but that's good. Good. We have, again, enthusiastic audiences. Next to, <laughs> next to Frank, we have Hugh Sisson, who's the founder of Heavy Seas and Brewery in Baltimore, which is actually the country's largest producer of cask beer. Um, he'll be also be talking about the 19th century. Next to Hugh, also in our 19th century corner, we have John Grinspan, a curator here at the, in the Division of Political History at the museum. And he is the author of The Virgin Vote, How Young Americans Made Democracy Social, Politics Personal, and Voting Popular in the 19th Century. Next to John, in the Prohibition Era corner, we have Kate Hallman, who is an associate professor in the Department of History at American University and the author of The Politics of Fashion in 18th Century America. And rounding out our quintet, <laughs> rounding out our quintet and looking at everyone's favorite decade of the 1970s, tonight we have Charlie Papazian, founder and past president of the Brewers Association and author of a book, which maybe some of you have, maybe, <laughs> called The Complete Joy of Home Brewing. So. Charlie, Charlie. <laughs> our panel, so if our panel could raise their glasses now, yeah, okay, good, we'll toast to kicking off our panel, and then I will cheers, cheers, and then I will hand that off to Frank, your five minutes starts now.
Good evening. Nice to see all of you tonight. I'm glad you all came out. I'm very excited to be here and to talk about beer, because it's always fun to talk about beer, right? Uh, I'm also going to talk a little about women and beer, uh, because actually, there would be no beer without women. Uh, true. And, and in fact, uh, really throughout history, until basically my time period, most people who made beer were women. Ladies, any ladies out there today who brew? A couple. Here we go. All right, good. It, that is very good to see. Um, so, uh, but for the formation of beer, uh, throughout most of the ancient history of beer, throughout the Middle Ages, uh, and right up until the 18th century, uh, brewing was often the work of women, brewsters, as they would be properly called. Uh, and they would be the ones who were making the beer because beer was basically a home product in most of these cases. Rather than large commercial operations producing thousands of, of barrels of beer, uh, beer was brewed at home by mom. Uh, and so it was part of the everyday chores that, that you ladies got to do every day. Laundry, cooking, brewing beer, uh, making cider, uh, any of the other fun jobs that you would have at home at the time. So. It was very much a, a home uh, project and, and very much part of uh, the realm of, of the work of women. Uh, it, as my job today, I work at Colonial Williamsburg and I do historic food there. And, and I work at the Governor's Palace Kitchen and pretty much every day I'm there in my costume cooking away. Somebody comes in and says, wouldn't you be a woman? <laughs> I, I kind of pause for a second and, and I point out that, well, uh, in most households, yes, it was mom who did the cooking, just like it was mom who did the brewing. Uh, but in fact, uh, professional cooks were generally men. Uh, men had the advantage of professional training that women did not at this time. And so uh, you see for people like the royal governor, they would hire French chefs, professionally trained European males. They won't call them chefs yet, but they would refer to them as principal or head cooks. And those people would be in charge of of, of uh, the kitchen and, and doing the cooking there uh, in these wealthy households. But in most households, it, it's simply mom who's doing all that work. Uh, and then these things begin to change. And it begins to change in the 18th century, I think initially primarily as a result of some technological advances. One of them is here in this room. Back in the corner, John has in his collection back there uh, a sacrometer as it was known uh, in the 18th century, a hydrometer, as you home brewers might refer to it today as. Uh, this device allows you to measure the amount of sugar and suspension in a liquid and thereby figure out actually how much alcohol is in your beer. It's only in the 18th century that we could actually figure this out. Uh, this has important ramifications, not only in terms of taxes, the English government uh, at one point made about 30% of their income off of beer taxes. Uh, brewers were really heavily taxed. They were taxed on the malt, they were taxed on the fuel, they were taxed on the hops, and they were taxed on the finished product. Uh, so the English crown made a great deal of money from their beer uh, and from taxing it uh, at the time. And so professional brewers were facing that taxes, but mom at home would not be. Uh, so another reason why a lot of beer was brewed at home is it saved some money uh, in that sense. But as, as technology starts to come into the play, we start to see larger and larger breweries develop uh, throughout the 18th century. This really starts with the beer, actually, that uh, we're serving back at the Aleworks uh, Tavern tonight. It's Porter. Porter, in many ways, is responsible for the industrial revolution of brewing in England and, and to some degree here in America as well. And as this brew c comes along, it becomes a, a product that is produced in very large quantities uh, and, and you start to see men taking over this industry and running it. Uh, and, and especially in England at this time, by 1770s, uh, the top 10 porter brewers in the city of London were producing over 370,000 barrels of beer a year. Uh, so mass production of beer starts in this period. Uh, and basically, uh, home brewing starts to fall off more and more. And, and eventually it becomes to the point where in the early 70s, uh, most all beer was made by men. Uh, it is a very shocking and it, to me sometimes really surprising transition 
that occurs in that 100-year period between most women being brewers in, say, 1710, most of your beer came from, from women brewers. By 1780, most of your beer came from professional men. Uh, so there's this period of transition that occurs in the 18th century, and it has a lot to do with the industrialization of brewing, uh, but that doesn't fully explain it in my mind. I think uh, there's a, a couple of, of other reasons that might go into this, this complete transformation of brewing from being women's work to becoming men's work uh, in this period. And someday in the future, uh, maybe somebody will be able to sit down and study all that and come up with a lovely book on the subject. In the meantime, beer being very important to all of us throughout the colonial period, it, it was, it was, you know, a lot of times you'll hear this the story that people drank beer because the water wasn't safe. Uh, that's that's a bit of an exaggeration. Uh, people drank beer because they liked it. Always have, always will. Uh, and in addition, they thought beer was healthy and nutritious, uh, and water was not really particularly exciting. Let's face it, no one's gotten fat from drinking water, right? <laughs> Plenty of people have gotten fat from drinking beer. So therefore, beer must be healthy and nutritious, at least by an 18th century definition of those words. Uh, so you start to see uh, the consumption of beer by women, children, men, all through this period, uh, not as a way to, to avoid drinking water, uh, but as a way to have a healthier substitute uh, than water. Uh, you have to drink water. If you have ever lived in the summer in Virginia or the D.C. area here, for that matter, uh, you will know that you could not survive drinking only beer uh, all summer long. I uh, could I, argue that. I, I've <laughs> tried it, but uh, Hugh, Hugh, Hugh is a tougher man than I, and he, he may have been able to get away with that. But uh, you need a little bit of water in there. Uh, what you don't want to do is drink water from a public city well 200 years ago. Those things are com somewhat dangerous, and people understood that water was a purveyor of epidemics, as it was called at some periods of the time. So uh, there is a, a, always has been a big uh, love for beer here in America uh, because it's viewed as a, as a healthy and nutritious alternative. It was also the cheapest beverage made by man 200 years ago, so uh, another good reason for drinking beer. Uh, that love of beer continued well into the 19th century, and uh, Hugh is going to come up and tell us a little bit about uh, um, beer drinking and the love of beer in the early 19th century as well. Okay, beer gets bigger. It's a wonderful thing. Um, and as beer gets bigger, the, uh, as it moves out of the household into the more of the commercial arena, uh, and as the individual taverns and the inns are not necessarily all making their own beer, uh, it becomes necessary to have it produced in one place and transported to another. Okay, problem. What do you put it in? You put it in, at the time, barrels. And the beer, which is completely different from what we're used to today, uh, when they would bring the barrel, they would put it uh, in a cradle, and they would literally take a, uh, a faucet and a mallet and drive it into the barrel to tap the barrel, hence the expression, tapping a keg, um, and the beer would be unfiltered, and with any luck, it went uh, underwent a secondary fermentation inside the barrel, which is why it had any carbonation at all, uh, and then the beer would be poured by gravity feed, or if they were a very sophisticated place, they would have what they is called a beer engine, where the beer would be actually pumped out of the barrel. Um, and, and then it would be served in the, in the public houses. So that whole approach to serving beer is what we now call cask-conditioned beer or real ale. Uh, if you're a beer Nazi uh, out, of the, out of Great Britain, uh, in, in any event, that's something that, that Heavy Seas Beer specializes in. We brought two cask-conditioned beers, which we're pouring at our table over there, we're doing a, a session IPA and an Imperial ESB. So, what the hell is cask beer and how does this tie in? Obviously it ties in because this is the way you would have gotten draft beer uh, back in this particular period of time. Um, 
you will find if you try it that it is not pristine clear. Uh, we'd like it to be a little clearer than the one that we're serving over there, so you would have to let it settle and allow gravity to actually pull any of the yeast, et cetera, out of it. Uh, we brought these casks in two days ago so they could sit downstairs horizontal, uh, and, and then unfortunately the gentleman who brought them upstairs right before we tapped them had them sitting straight up in the, th in the cradle as he was walking them out. So that's an OF moment, but what the hell. Um, <laughs> So, so in any event, uh, I didn't say it. <laughs> I thought I stepped right over that. That, that was pretty good. So in any event, um, so it's not quite as pristine clear as we'd like it to see, but it would never be as crystal clear as the beers that we're used to today. You know, it's almost unfortunate that in, in, in today's beer world, um, y you know, we, we, we like everything polished and super bright, et cetera, and there's a lot to be said, not for necessarily muddy and cloudy and, and uh, unprofessionally produced products, but there's a lot to be said for the old artisanal approach where, you know what, if it's not absolutely you can see through it and the guy on the other side actually still looks good, um, you know, there's something to be said for that. So, anyway, so that's what we're doing over there. Uh, and uh, if you haven't tried it, you should try it. I happen to think that cast condition beer is draft beer at its highest possible expression. Um, there are people who argue that point with me, and they would be wrong. Um, but regardless, you should try it as part of the experience. If you're interested in the history of food and beer, et cetera, in this country, that's certainly one of those chapters. All right? Awesome. Next. election in 10 days, and in the next 10 days you're going to hear a lot about voter turnout and get out the vote devices, but you won't hear that much about the best get out the vote mechanism in American history, which is beer, especially beer served in saloons, which is a bedrock, bedrock of 19th century politics. This is a time, this is the high tide of saloon culture in America. It's also the high tide of voter turnout in America. In 1840, voter turnout shoots up. 70 to 80 percent of eligible voters and rockets along for the next 60 years at 80 percent of eligible voters. Huge numbers of people are going to the polls. And these elections are really popular and they're fought out on the ground. And they're really popular particularly among working class people. Working men, laborers, dock workers, farmers. The idea back then, very different from today, was that people who had higher educations and were wealthier didn't go to the polls. They saw that as kind of for the riffraff or the rabble. And there was an expression, a gentleman never votes. So campaigns are run on the ground by the saloon keeper, the butcher, the dock worker. And these people congregate in saloons because they need saloons. This is a time of huge economic and social disruption. This is the industrial revolution, the Gilded Age. People are coming in from Germany, from Ireland, moving from small towns to cities and their lives are profoundly shaken. It's a very difficult time to be an unemployed working man. This is a boom and bust economy. The saloon offers them not just solace and a sense of brotherhood, but a political organization. People meet in saloons, they drink in saloons, and they talk politics in saloons. And they drink lager beer, which is brought by the Germans and becomes more popular over the century. And I don't think it's an accident that they're drinking beer. Americans previously had drank much more whiskey, but I think there's something about beer drinking that makes you sit and talk and be sociable a little slower and a little more thoughtful than what happens when you're drinking whiskey all day long. So <laughs> beer gave us that, that kind of talking through democracy. Saloons become crucial institutions for these working men. You meet in a saloon, you meet the candidates in the saloon, you talk politics in the saloon, and it's a key institution that's often run by saloon keepers. The people who run saloons become key in these political machines because they know they're drinkers, so they know voters. They know who's gonna turn out on election day, who's not reliable, who's gonna get too drunk to make his way to the polls on his own. They know who can give a good speech, they know who can break somebody's nose if you need them to. <laughs> there are political assassinations in this time, they know who might be good at that. And they know what people need. They know what working man just lost his job and can't feed his family and might benefit from a good city job or something like that. So this is a corrupt system in a way, but it gets a lot of working people voting. This lasts in the 1860s, 1870s, 1880s, incredibly high voter turnout, real engagement on the ground by saloon keepers and by young people too. Uh, one of the jobs of young people, 12, 15, 17 year olds on election day is to go around to saloons and grab the drunks by the hand and kind of bring them to vote. 
there's a special level of, of drunkenness you want from your voter. You want them just drunk enough to listen to you and to cast a ballot, but not so drunk that they can't make it up to the window and vote themselves. This era comes under question in the late 19th century as part of kind of the class war of the Gilded Age. Wealthier people, upper middle class and elite people don't like this idea of a democracy dominated on the ground by saloon keepers and butchers and dock workers. And they realize that the way to shut off this kind of politics is to go after the institution, to go after the saloon. So first they close saloons on election days, and then they close saloons in counties and in states, and ultimately they lead, this leads to prohibition. There are a lot of other important angles to prohibition that Kate will cover, a lot of gendered angles, and there are good reasons for prohibition as well, but part of it is this class war being expressed through the saloon. In the early 20th century, there, this uh, prohibitionist tide is rising, and this period of saloon culture is falling away. And the best example of this is something called the First Ward Ball, which was something held in the 1890s in Chicago. And Chicago's First Ward, I don't know if any of you know it in Chicago, it's the red light, was the red light district and kind of the slum. And every year as a political fundraiser during this period, a couple saloon keepers would hold a massive ball, which would be attended by the guys in the saloons, the local prostitutes, the madams, the thieves, the criminals, but also the mayor and the aldermen. It'd be this big <laughs> celebration, they drank, in 1897, they drank 35,000 quarts of beer in one night at this event, and they would also ultimately end up in this kind of Congo line, being led by this saloon keeper who always wore a green swallowtail coat and purple pants and yellow shoes and was just this, this ringleader of this massive political event. The elites in Chicago can't end the first board ball, but they take away its liquor license in 1909. And there's this tragic account of the first first ward ball with no booze allowed, no lager to be served. And there's this amazing description of these basically half gangster, half politicians, guys with nicknames like Wrecking Crew Jerry and Bathhouse John, sitting around in bright lights, drinking tea, and, and wishing they were dead, basically. And you know the, <laughs> the lights have been turned up on this party. This era when politics and beer are tied together for good and for bad is really over in the 20th century. There was a lot of bad side of saloon politics, but there was something appealing about it too. And I know personally, uh, next, uh, the Tuesday after next on election day, I'm gonna drink a lager before I go vote. Oh, John set this up so beautifully. Um, but in stark contrast to, to Frank um, and his women brewers, um, I'm gonna be talking about women against beer and against really all other forms of alcohol too, and against saloons too. Um, oh, I know, what a bummer. Why do I get this part? I, uh, <laughs> dang, okay. I want you to imagine though, if you will, you um, approaching a bar uh, in your neighborhood, maybe for a drink after work and encountering a, w a group of uh, well-dressed, well-heeled women singing a hymn or maybe on their knees praying aloud, blocking the entrance to the place. What do you do? Well, if you're a man of the late 19th century, you might not want to kind of muscle your way through this group of uh, pious, proper ladies, and you might decide to make your way on down to another watering hole. Um, and if you encountered a similar scenario there, you might make your way on home. And so, um, for one drinker at least, one patron of a bar, these women's work had succeeded. Uh, so I want to emphasize a couple of points tonight in my five minutes. Um, per the title of the talk, which is The Political Women of Prohibition, I want to talk about temperance as women's political activism, perhaps the most important public platform for women uh, before the franchise and very much accepted as such. And second, a way that, a platform that provided a way for women to make an argument about suffrage and its importance. So I want to discuss a little bit who these women are, what they did and why. A little bit of historical context. Um, the post-Civil War period in, in kind of ways that John talked about saw an increase in alcohol consumption um, for various reasons. And temperance movements of the pre-Civil War period had been pretty successful in bringing down consumption. But in particular, saloons proliferate, saloon politics. Um, saloons move into the Trans-Mississippi West. And even though alcohol had been long important in machine and party politics, it becomes increasingly important and bigger and bigger business. So we see renewed temperance activism in this context. In 1869, you get an actual political party to support prohibition, the Prohibition Party, and they, importantly, invite women to be members. Um, this is new. But this kind of um, overt 
political partisan activism is suspect for many women. And so they form their own organization, the Women's Christian Temperance Union, WCTU, in 1873. And this becomes the largest organization of women that had ever existed in the United States. Um, by the 1890s, you have several hundred thousand members, uh, chapters across the country, and these are middle class, so there's a class politics to this that, that John alluded to, Christian women, but really Protestant, and this is important because they really kind of go after Catholics and Catholic immigrants as targets and as, as would-be drinkers. Um, these are not solely white women. There are black club and church women who become temperance activists. They join chapters in the North and the Midwest. They form their own chapters in the Jim Crow South. Um, what did they do? Well, they began with this approach of moral suasion. Sounds really fun, doesn't it? I mean, that's the parlance of the day. Um, and the idea is that if you can just convince inherently good people of their bad, their sinful actions, their behavior, they will reform themselves. So through conversation, through printed literature, uh, education, public shaming, such as the praying's that I mentioned. So that was one approach. But there's also um, Carrie Nation, um, some of you may know of her, who very dramatically, a member of the WCTU in Kansas, took bricks to saloon windows, hatchets to casks of alcohol um, in dramatic fashion. Um, most women, temperance women, sort of prided themselves on more decorous forms of activism than that. Um, but the WCTU trained women up in public speaking, in um, how to run an organization, to stage events. Um, and as the organization evolved, their tactics did too. I mean, they maintained this moral suasion approach, but they also moved in a more expressly political direction. And Frances Willard, who became the president of the WCTU in 1879, said, do everything. And so as part of that, that meant pushing for legal reform, legislation, and the passage of prohibition laws local level, the blue laws, state, and on up to national prohibition, petitioning, and importantly, attempting to influence the voting men in their families and their communities. I mean, we can't lay national prohibition entirely at the feet of the WCTU, perhaps, but um, they were certainly a force. So finally, why? Why was this, why were they doing this? The political women of prohibition genuinely believed that alcohol was the destroyer of home and family. They saw, often accurately, women and children become victims of drunk and abusive husbands, um, uh, stumbling out of the voting <laughs> po polling place, perhaps, or the saloon. They argued, maybe a little less accurately, that men who were supposed to be providers, so they had a pretty traditional view of gender roles and of the household economy, uh, drank away their earnings, right, and they, and or lost jobs due to their drinking, leaving their families destitute. So their motto was home and protection. But exclusion from the franchise was always a problem, and especially as the movement became more legislation oriented. But this was also an opportunity for these women. So many women and some men argued vis-a-vis -vis temperance that, and I'll just quote the infamous Carrie Nation here, the loving moral influence of mothers must be put into the ballot box. And so it's interesting, they use this frankly moralistic, maternalistic language to push for full inclusion in the polity. And this is ultimately, I think, more than rights talk or political equality arguments. This, these are the arguments that for many Americans are more compelling in terms of getting that constitutional amendment to the franchise passed, and it's one that is related to and comes out of uh, women's bummer temperance activism in part. Thank you. Well, I want to note Fred uh, dressed the part of colonial times, and I consciously uh, dressed the part of the 1970s and wore my Paisley shirt, if some of you recall. Um, there's a lot of things that happened in the 1970s. I live that those years. Um, and I want to give you a flavor of the many things that I experienced and perceived during that, those, that decade. And by the way, if you want to get the, a little bit more authentic flavor of what my first homebrew tasted like, 
go to that corner and taste that prohibition. It actually tastes a little bit better than my first homebrew. My I first brewed beer, my first homebrew, in 1970. Coincidentally, I turned 21 in 1970. I don't think that had anything to do with me wanting to brew beer. It was a, a coincidental encounter with an a old-time prohibition home brewer, and uh, I got turned on to beer in 1970 in Charlottesville, Virginia, as a matter of fact. The state of beer in the late 60s and throughout the 70s was going downhill in many ways in this country. By the early, very early 80s, there were only about 42 brewing companies in the United States. Today, there are going to be, by year end, about 5,000. So a lot has changed. <laughs> and there's some fundamental things that happened in the 70s that, I, I, that, that really influenced the transition, the awareness that we all discovered about beer. And one of the things that happened was that in the 1970s, air travel became much more accessible to people. People began traveling not only around the United States much more easily, but around the world. And people would go to Europe and they would taste beer and they would come back to the United States saying, man, how come the beer in England and Germany and other parts of the Europe is so great and we got to drink this crap? <laughs> I mean, that was, that, there was so many people were just wondering, why can't we do it? So home brewing began to emerge in 1972. Um, I'd graduated from the University of Virginia. I moved out to Colorado. And in the 70s, you're seeing, for the lack of a better term, the kind of towards the end of the counterculture period of our, our history. People were doing things that they'd never done before, and they had different attitudes about doing things. And there was a community free school that if you wanted in Boulder, Colorado, and if you wanted to teach something, you could teach it to anybody. And I was approached, and they discovered that I knew how to make beer, and they asked me, hey, why don't you teach a class in beer making? So I did, and that was the beginning of where I am today. Um, I taught a 1,000 people uh, over a 10-year period in my home on Tuesday nights. First of Monday nights, but then they had Monday night football, so I had to change it to Tuesday night. <laughs> A little bit of history there, 1970s. Um, but I taught home brewing every Tuesday evening. There was plenty of news co coverage. I was on television quite often. I was in the newspaper, feature stories. It was just interesting. But it was still illegal then, which kind of made it more fun. <laughs> but it was illegal in the United States. Let me backtrack. The people that took my beer class were different kind of beer drinker. They were interested in the camaraderie and the culture that we all experience today with, with craft beer and craft brewing and the camaraderie of the community, talking about beer flavor, and people from all walks of life. I'd say 40 to 50 percent of the people that took my class were women throughout that entire period. And they were professionals, and they were workers, they were blue collar, they were executives. They were beer distributors. They were beer retailers. They were scratching their head. They were, you hear about Charlie Papazian's beer making class. I'm going to check it out. And they would be astounded that people would get together for two hours on the living room floor and in, in my kitchen brewing beer and talk about beer in a way that they had never, ever experienced or observed ever before. Because to most Americans, there was nothing to talk about beer. It's a six pack and you drink it and you don't talk about the beer. But this was different. And I have to tell you a little story. Um, I got a call from the registrar at Community Free School in the, in the mid-70s when, it, when I, I had become a bit notorious uh, with my classes. And they said, Charlie, uh, just giving you a heads up, there's a, a suspicious guy that registered for your class. We think he's from the ATF, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. <laughs> just be aware. And I, you know, I had enough, you know, it was, didn't bother me a bit. And this guy showed up in 1970s, Boulder, Colorado, paisley shirts, you know, tie-dyes, the whole thing. And he shows up with a white shirt and a skinny black tie. <laughs> I knew my man. I knew who he, I, I knew, 
And he got into it, rolled up his sleeves, and we talked about beer, and he talked about it. He drank beer. And I made a point. like, it's illegal, but the ATF, if they're listening, um, has better things to do than bust homebrewers. So just don't sell the beer. I think that's what they're mostly concerned with. And I just kept doing what I always did. I just did it. I just did it. We all did it. It was the element of illegal homebrewing made a little bit fun. But by 1978, Congress here in Washington, D.C., on their Jimmy Carter, they uh, passed a law legalizing homebrewing. In 1978, it was signed into law in 1979. And after that, all the states had to legalize it because it was still, you know, the states' rights, <laughs> states' rights, the states still regulated alcohol at that level. So every state began legalizing homebrew. And I have a little bit of an artifact here. A T-shirt that kind of encapsulates and puts clothes to an era. This is a shirt from the Mississippi Homebrewers, legalized homebrew. And it was a year ago that Mississippi and Alabama both legalized homebrew, the last two states. Now, I think they weren't, they didn't want to be, this is my theory, they didn't want to be known as the last state to legalize homebrewing. So one state, I forget which one it was, one state passed legislation first, legalizing homebrewer, and the other state implemented the law first. So who was the last state? What was the last state? You gotta take it into context. When the law was passed or when the actual law went into implementation. So that's a little history. Um, a few other things. Uh, the Maltos Falcons, the first homebrew club that we know of in the United States was, was, uh, was founded in 1974 in California. Uh, the Nike slogan, Just Do It, was emerged in the late 1970s, and it kind of encapsulated what we were doing. I mean, we just did it. it you know, it, it was their mo brand and their logo, their saying, but it also encapsulated people's attitudes in the 1970s. We were doing things that no one had ever done before. The other thing that's interesting, in the 1976, April 1st, April Fool's, According to Wikipedia, um, Steve Jobs, the founder of Apple and the Macintosh Computer Company, belonged to a homebrew club called the Homebrew Computer Club. And that's where Apple Computer emerged. And that Apple Computer was founded April 1st, 1976. So there's a lot of things happening that emerged out of the attitude of we can do it, we can brew it. And lastly, I just want to say the saying, relax, don't worry, have a homebrew, also emerged in the 1970s, which, which is a mantra of many homebrewers. And it's an attitude and a culture. And from that, just do it. Relax, don't worry, have a homebrew. Just try it. Craft brewing emerged because a lot of these homebrewers said, hey, my friends tell me I should start a brewery. And they did. And now we have 5,000. And if you ask them, what are your origins? Most of them will say home brewing. So there's a lot of things that happen. That just gives you a little bit of flavor of what I experienced in the 1970s and how that culture and that those moments and that attitude that we had really influenced uh, where we are today. So now that we have taken you on a journey from the beginning of the Republic up to the changes in the 1970s that led to where we are today, I can safely say this is probably the only time you've covered all of American history through beer in 30 minutes. Um, and now we're going to open it up for questions. So Steve has a microphone over here. So if anyone has a question, you can raise your hand, ask it of the panel. Um, but as you are, there's one in the back there, Steve, maybe but at, like all the way behind the camera. So you do this behind the camera. <laughs> but before, as we head over there, I'm gonna ask um, all of you if there was a story that you heard from someone else that you think influences what you do today. Well, I, 
person like to see everybody get hammered before they go to the polls. So. <laughs> the opinions of our panel are not representative of the Smithsonian. <laughs> All right, Steve. In this election? <laughs> you might want to rethink Steve that. has a question in the back. <laughs> yes, hello. Um, I read somewhere that in the uh, right around when 1776, when uh, we became a country, that there was a lot of cider being drank more than beer. Um, so I was just curious as to what led to the transition from, if, if that's true, and what led to the transition to more beer drinking than cider drinking. Um, it, it seems to me that as I look at it more, it, it tends to be an urban versus rural thing. In the cities, there's more beer being consumed. In the countryside, there's more cider being consumed. This is <laughs> primarily 18th century Virginia. That's my area of, of expertise. So I can't attest to that in, in say, Boston or uh, other locations. But w what I found in colonial Virginia was that, that a lot of the, the cider, especially in Virginia, was a little further west past Richmond up in the, the Charlottesville area, that's where the best apple growing uh, portion of the state was. And so you see a whole lot of cider there. Um, and in the Tidewater, you see a lot of people home brewing with molasses. Rather than making their beer with grain, they're using molasses, wheat bran, and hops and boiling all this together. And, and that's what the, the house fives in the, in the Tidewater seem to be doing. So I, I think there's, a, a, to some degree, a, a lot. Of, there certainly is a lot of cider being consumed in this period. Uh, but there's also a fair amount of beer being being made here, and and it seems to be more of an urban thing than than a rural thing. So uh, I think that may be part of the uh, the difference is that uh, you see more beer in the cities and, and more cider in the country. So Charlie, in your um, experience with homebrewing, were there home cider clubs as well, and did you guys talk to each other? Um, there were people that discovered both uh, winemaking. Uh, cider making and particularly mead making. Uh, Can you explain what mead is? If mead we don't is, have any is fermented, uh, fermented honey beverage, a bev fermented beverage primarily uh, made from honey and water. And that was actually predates beer because it's, it was an available sugar that um, early man had access to in limited quantities, but it was easily fermented. You didn't have to go through a malting process or, you know, sprouting grains or sh crushing grapes or growing. It was just there for the taking. So that was one of the earliest alcoholic beverages uh, that man. So we were interested in this stuff, but you know, it was a pretty bad scene if you were into <laughs> flavorful beer in the 70s. And we, we made a lot of different beers. And you know, some of the beers we made today, you wouldn't believe it, but when I made my first honey lager, putting honey in beer, putting spices in beer, putting fruit in beer. People were flabbergasted. <laughs> it was like so extreme. I mean, you think imperial, imperial barley wine seems extreme now uh, with, with cocoa and all kinds of things in it. Just honey in beer was astoundingly crazy in those days. Great, and we have another question in the audience. Yes. Hi, uh, wonderful panel. This is very exciting to get to ask everybody a question. Um, I was wondering if you think there is a beer style that really encapsulates the time periods that you've been talking about, or maybe more broadly, if there's sort of a quintessential American beer style. So very good question. As you move through your eras, is there a particular beer style that exemplifies it? Um, and if anyone wants to tackle what makes American beer as an American beer style, have at it. We have like five minutes, so. Uh, I, the colonial period, Porter was, was definitely king in, in the early part of the period, uh, but the pale ale starts to take over towards the end of the 18th century, and you see this sort of gradual transition. Porter created in London, spread throughout the English Empire very, very rapidly, very popular in the 1750s. It, it was everywhere. Uh, but by 1780, uh, it's, it's sort of run, beginning to run its course, and, and actually the height of Porter production was like 1824, I think. Uh, and, and after that, it slowly slowed down, and, and you see more and more pale ales coming on. Pale ales were clear. You could read a newspaper through them. Uh, they, they could you drink them in glass, uh, whereas, and it didn't look like a big cloudy mess like Porter might have when it was poured in glasses at that time. But Porter was definitely the beer of the early 18th century, but, but loses ground to pale ales in the 19th century. I think... Um 
by the time you get to the mid 80s, uh, hoppy styles of pale ale uh, emerging from the West Coast clearly take over and become the dominant style. And then by the time you get to the late 90s, it's even even hoppier version, the IPA that becomes the dominant style uh, of, of the category and clearly of the American uh, beer industry. I mean, I don't know a single commercial brewer right now. Uh, uh, well, I, I actually know one or two, but for most of us, our IPA is easily the best-selling beer that we make. So that seems to be what's driving the boat. And that was yeah, eight, that 1980s and 1980s. Yeah, 1990s. well, I, 1980s pale ale, 1990s uh, IPA. Got it. Well, back in the 1880s, uh, the people <laughs> I'm talking about are drinking lagers and pilsners specifically. And I don't know what the American beer is today, but I want to jump back to cider for one second because cider had its own moment in American politics. In the election of 1840, William Henry Harrison is the nominee, and his opponents say, he's an old drunk, give him a barrel of hard cider and you'll never hear from him again. And his campaign takes that on and makes it their issue, or makes it their image, and starts distributing hard cider around the nation. And they get the biggest jump in voter turnout in American <laughs> history, one with his hard cider. So alcohol and politics go together really nicely. Um, so I, lager, too, from my period, which is uh, overlaps with John's. And one of the, the piece, one piece I didn't get to talk about is that lager and pilsners are associated with Germans and German Americans, German immigrants, and that there's a, a piece of the temperance movement, temperance activism, that is very anti-immigrant and sort of classist and somewhat racist as well. Um, so, but there, but my ladies are also very concerned about spirits, demon rum, whiskey. So it's not limited to beer. Um, per the cider topic, which I had a thought about that too. You know, prohibition did not prohibit consumption. It was production, transport, sale. And the Volstead Act, which implemented prohibition, had an important provision accepting the creation of basically homemade wine and hard cider so that, that farmers, so this was a one kind of loophole or end around production, much less consumption of, um, of alcoholic beverages. You know, well, the, the rum thing, sorry, I, I'm glad you mentioned it because it seems like prohibition propaganda is always going after the rum shop and the grog shop, but who in the late 19th century is drinking rum anymore? It seems yeah, really it shows how out of touch with the people they're talking about they are. But I think whiskey, bourbon, I mean like other, yeah, hard spirits, but the, the demon rum, the rum is, is more the, the 18th century drink. Absolutely. You know, the, the, the whole subject of the, you know, what is an American style, when you, an indigenous style that started here, well, you know, the immigrant, the, the early settlers largely came from, many of them came from England, so the English ales were, were founded here, and then there was a massive immigration from the Germans in the late 18th, 19th century, 1800s, and they brought their beer culture over here. Um, and some of that, that mix of not only the, the old world beer culture, but the climate and the environment that we live here in the United States is much warmer and and the the materials that they that they had available to them the the types of barley and the hops were were different than what they had over Europe so in order to get that that flavor of the european flavor they used corn and rice and those other adjuncts to kind of actually mimic and get close to the european authentic european version so they it was also actually an enhancer and that was an enhanced style of beer up until probably the 50s when women began drinking more beer um, and after World War II and they were to appeal to the light beer drink, to, to, to the women's, they thought they were appealing to women's palates. All I know a lot of women that love IPA, as many of you do, I'm sure. Um, they, they lightened the character and they could sell more and they had higher volumes and their business model was different. And just another note, as far as what is an American style beer, the Mayan cultures and the, and the American indigenous people here in this, on this continent were making beers, kinds of beers from honey and corn and chili peppers and chocolate and roots of plants and which preceded the discovery by Columbus. So it goes back a long way. So you could have many beers over a discussion about what is the American <laughs> beer style, which is a good thing. All right, we have time for one more question. Thanks very much for uh, all of your opinions. Um, quick question for, for all of you about just in, in terms of sort of historically, I don't know if we had like SAB Miller and InBev sort of conglomerates historically. Um, moving forward, how do you think that 
uh, breweries can maintain some of their independence and stay true to their roots? Uh, and where do you think sort of the most avant-garde American breweries exist today, or, or name a few maybe? So the question is about the larger corporations that own multiple breweries and some consolidation of breweries. So where was that happening? His is that is now the first time that's ever happened? No. Um, it when happened has that in happened the before? 80, you know, in the in the 70s it happened. It was down to 42 breweries, and they were predicting in the 1970s. There were experts, the knowledgeable, the gurus, the industry experts. Oh, in 10, 15 years, there'll only be three or four breweries in the whole country. That's what the wisdom was in those days. But we knew better because we were we were just doing it. And then going even earlier to our 19th century crowd. Oh, no, I was about? actually just thinking that it happened. I mean, something like that happens as early as in the beard Frank was talking about. You go from home brews to professional brewing, and whenever that happens, there's often a kind of gender shift, too, and it becomes a more masculine, masculinized industry. Um, going forward, I don't know. I mean, I'll leave it to the people who more do contemporary, you know, brewing culture to speak to that, I think. Well, I'm willing to speculate wildly. Um, <laughs> Great. <laughs> one of the Good historian. Yeah, right. <laughs> Bad historian. One of the things that really makes works in the 19th century is the saloon as an institution. The lager they're drinking, some of it's good, some of it's bad. It doesn't matter as much as an institution where people congregate and they talk and they interact. So I, I guess moving forward, while everyone cares about home brewing, where are you drinking, who are you meeting, how are you interacting? We don't have that much public space in America, and I think that hurts our politics in many ways. So more places to meet and interact and talk over two beers, not ten, is, is a good idea. Yeah, I, one of the things I really important thing that I forgot to mention in my talk um, was that I founded the American Home Brewers Association in 1978. And that was a result <laughs> of this, m this community of a thousand home brewers that had taken my class. And it was all about our group as a community and we would get together. And that community spirit is what's driving craft brewer, a lot about what's driving craft brewers and craft beer today. So you talk about the big, the mega breweries, you know, will they gobble up everybody? Not as long as people value community, their own community, and the community of others, and that value is reflected in the, the types of products and beers that are being brewed on a local level. As long as that remains important and is valuable, this will continue for more than just the foreseeable future. And with, My oh, go ahead. I was gonna say, it's a perfect ending for us to create our own community by drinking some beers together after the panel. A huge thank you to everyone up here for everything that you've added there. There are beers to sample and objects out of storage to look at. You can ask questions of our panel and continue the conversation and community building together here. Thank you all again for joining us for the Smithsonian Food History Weekend. And uh, mark your calendars for 2017's Food History Weekend. And we look forward to seeing you then. Thanks.